In 2015, the United States imported $4 billion worth of coffee. According to the Coffee Association of Canada, who knew there was such a thing, over two-thirds of Canadians have consumed coffee daily and is estimated to be a $6.2 billion industry. In 2013, 4.8 million tons of tea was consumed globally. Now, the reason why people consume coffee and tea is because it contains a psychoactive substance called caffeine, making caffeine easily the most widely used and popular psychoactive substance in the world. In this video, I'm first going to go over some of the basic pharmacological information about caffeine, and then in the second half, I'm going to talk about how and where caffeine acts in the brain to produce the psychoactive effects that it has. So, let's get started. Caffeine is classified as a stimulant drug, meaning that it increases activity in the body at some level. Chemically, caffeine is called a methylxanthine alkaloid. Uh, it's legal pretty much everywhere on the planet, however, some religious groups ban the use of it, particularly the Mormons if you happen to live in North America. In the United States, how much caffeine you can put into a product is limited, unless it's a supplement of course, and then you can pretty much do whatever you want with it. And there's basically two ways of getting caffeine, and that's either by consuming plant products that contain the molecule, like coffee or tea, which is what most people do, or you can synthesize it in a lab. Uh, but most often you take coffee beans or some leaves and you run some hot water through it and you get most of the caffeine out. So by far, so by far the most popular way of consuming it is by drinking it. Here is a small infographic of caffeine content uh, in popular beverages. The standard single dose for an average human is going to be 100 to 500 milligrams. Uh, depending on, you know, whether you're male or a female, how fat you are, how accustomed you are, or habituated is the scientific term, to caffeine already. And it gets fully absorbed into the body uh, around 45 minutes after consuming it. So, what do people use caffeine for? Well, it has a number of effects. Con consuming caffeine at these amounts, from 100 to 500 milligrams, uh, will do a bunch of things, like it'll increase inten attention, It'll increase locomotor or psychomotor activity, which basically just means how much you move around uh, and how active you are. Um, it also affects physiological things like blood pressure, respiration, and water excretion. So the most common reasons for using it are its psychoactive effects like alertness uh, and stimulation. So things like, you know, working, studying, staying awake when you're driving, working out or getting pumped up. Medicinally, uh, you can use it to treat migraine headaches and, I think fairly interesting, uh, you can regulate breathing in babies uh, that have breathing problems, so go figure. Plasma levels of caffeine, so the bioavailability levels in your blood, drop by 50% about every two to four hours. And so the noticeable effects last about that long. Redosing, or basically drinking more coffee several times a day, is pretty common. Uh, now the concept of caffeine dependence and tolerance uh, will be common to most people watching this who've consumed coffee. Repeated use leads to the normal doses not working well enough, and so, you know, that's why you can buy coffee in small, medium, and large, and extra large. Uh, and dependence is very common, but it's not really an issue, because all that happens is you get headaches, and you're kind of irritable, right? And you're kind of sleepy, and so no one really cares, and no one really worries about it. Um, however, this can be kind of important if you have to do really important work that requires a lot of attention to detail. Uh, if you take way too much caffeine, then the positives usually turn into negatives. Uh, so yes, caffeine is actually lethal, and it will kill you if you take enough of it. Um, so if you take caffeine on the scale of, let's say, thousands of milligrams, caffeine acts as what's called uh, anxiogenic, or something that generates anxiety. Um, and you get uh, insomnia due to excessive activity and nervousness. Chronic high doses can lead to a debatably existent disorder called caffeinism, in which uh, you know, withdrawal symptoms escalate in intensity. Now, the toxic dose, you know, the dose that will kill you, is estimated to be around 150 to 200 milligrams per kilogram of body mass. So, you know, if you're like 80 kilograms, then it's like 80 to 110 cups of coffee. So, you know, nasty stuff. After it's had its effects and it's done its job in the body, caffeine gets metabolized by the liver 
uh, by something called cytochrome P450 oxidase enzyme system, uh, which is a series of proteins that metabolize, metabolize all sorts of drugs, uh, actually. Now remember, caffeine was classified as a methylxanthine, so when it's metabolized or broken down, the molecule gets transformed into three different dimethylxanthines. We have paraxanthine, theobromine, and theophylline, which when they circulate through the, bro the blood after the caffeine molecule is metabolized, uh, they do things in the body like increase lipolysis, dilate blood vessels, uh, and increase the urine volume. Most of all, um, you know, most of all this stuff, it gets excreted throughout the urine after a little bit while, and then, you know, you drink more coffee and the whole process starts over again. So, now that we've got all of that, you know, necessary background information out of the way, how does caffeine actually do what it does? How can we explain the behavioral and physiological and psychological effects of caffeine? Well, caffeine's primary mechanism of action is as an adenosine receptor antagonist, which basically means uh, that it blocks the adenosine receptor. Adenosine increases or decreases depending on the balance of available energy versus the amount of energy that your body actually needs. So, if we have too much energy in the form of ATP molecules, ATP becomes degraded into adenosine. Adenosine ends up having a depressant effect on the central nervous system. How does it do this? Well, adenosine is a neuromodulator, which means that when it is released from a single neuron, it doesn't just get sent to the neuron that it's attached to at the synaptic connection, it stays in the extracellular fluid and spreads out to a whole bunch of neurons, modulating them. Uh, adenosine binds to the adenosine receptor located at the presynapse, uh, and through a number of different proposed mechanisms, inhibits or prevents the release of excitatory neurotransmitters, such as glutamate, noradrenaline, acetylcholine, and dopamine. Uh, and if you prevent the release of chemicals that excite the brain, then you get a reduction in activity. What caffeine does is that it binds to and blocks the adenosine receptor without activating them, also making it impossible for adenosine to bind to it as well. So caffeine ends up increasing neurotransmitter release and exciting the brain. So, now that we know the molecular action of caffeine, that is, to block the adenosine receptor, leading to increases in excitatory neurotransmission, we're now going to talk about these effects as they relate to different brain systems, and how changes in these brain systems leads to the behavioral effects seen in caffeine use. Here I'm going to talk about a few select neural systems that utilize the neurotransmitters that caffeine ultimately affects. Adenosine receptors are all over the brain, but they're most prevalent in the hippocampus, the cortex, the cerebellum, and the thalamus. Uh, and many of the neurotransmitter systems that I'm going to talk about have adenosine receptors co-localized with the neurotransmitter receptors that they use. Um, or that is to say, they're on the same cells. Both that neurotransmitter receptor and the adenosine receptor are found co-localized on the same cells. Uh, and some receptors even have joint functions that are combined with the adenosine receptor. For example, there's an adenosine dopamine receptor complex in which the two bind together to have uh, multiple adenosine and dopamine related functions. And so because adenosine receptors uh, happen to be heavily concentrated in areas that use dopamine, that is where we will start. Caffeine intake has been shown to lead to an increase in dopamine in the striatum. Now a quick review on dopamine and the striatum. Dopamine is a neurotransmitter, specifically a neuromodulator like adenosine itself and is used in brain pathways involved in reward and motivation, as well as motor control and a whole bunch of other things. But for now, we're going to talk about what it does in reference to the striatum. So dopamine's involvement in reward and reinforcing pleasurable effects uh, of some drugs is what leads them to be addicting. Now the striatum is part of a larger system of brain regions referred to as the basal ganglia. And there are three general structures that constitute the striatum. The caudate, the nucleus accumbens, and the putamen, each with their own respective functions. The striatum makes use of dopamine and is a key brain region involved in the production of movements and the, rewar the reward and reinforcement of certain behaviors. So when you perform an action and this action gets rewarded, you eventually end up performing the action again because now you expect a reward. And the action, after being reinforced and rewarded multiple times, eventually uh, becomes what is called a habit. 
uh, and this is argued to happen inside the striatum. Now granted, this is also a very simplified way of describing striatal function, but you get the idea. And caffeine, like many drugs, is going to increase dopamine activity in this brain region, leading to reinforcement of caffeine consumption, as well as an increase in motor behaviors. Through reducing adenosine action, and thereby increasing the release of many types of neurotransmitters, caffeine gets some of its stimulant effects in two primary ways. The first is by increasing uh, the release of acetylcholine in the basal forebrain. Acetylcholine is a neurotransmitter uh, very common in neuromuscular junctions, basically you know, where neurons meet muscle tissue to activate movement of the muscle. But it's also very prevalent in the brain, in areas such as the neocortex and the hippocampus, and can support cognitive functions and memory. The basal forebrain is a collection of structures just below the striatum and is known for having an important role in sleep. The basal forebrain is the primary site of acetylcholine production in the brain and here we see a picture of what's called the cholinergic system in the brain or the spread of the neurotransmitter acetylcholine. And you'll notice some of the areas that make up the basal forebrain are listed here on this image as being sites of acetylcholine production. So, if acetylcholine, which is excitatory, or in other words activating, is uh, increased, then this promotes wakefulness in the basal forebrain. And a constantly turned on basal forebrain uh, will make it very difficult to fall asleep, as anyone who's consumed lots of coffee will know from experience. The second way is by increasing the effects of GABA at the tubero-mammillary nucleus. Uh, Unlike other neurotransmitters we've talked about so far, uh, GABA is inhibitory, so increasing GABA release will lead to a decline in activity as opposed to an incline. Um, so how does this come about? Well, acetylcholine, like we talked about, also acts on the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus is a small, dense collection of brain regions in which the tuberomamillary nucleus is one of them, uh, involved in hormone release, in sleep, uh, arousal, breathing, hunger, and a whole host of other things. One thing that high acetylcholine will do is it will increase the activity of the ventrolateral preoptic nucleus, which is in the hypothalamus. Now, what does this brain area do? Well, it increases inhibitory GABA release to other brain regions involved in regulating sleep. So adenosine will activate the ventrolateral preoptic area uh, and hence produce sleep-inducing effects in other areas. So caffeine, when it blocks this adenosine receptor, as well as increasing acetylcholine, which also shuts off the ventrolateral preoptic area, uh, this will lead to less GABA. Less GABA means less inhibition. Less inhibition means more activity in sleep-regulating brain areas, which leads to arousal and heightened activity. The same rules apply to the tuberomamillary nucleus and the production of yet another neurotransmitter, histamine, which gets sent to the neocortex, causing the release of acetylcholine and hence heightened cortical activity and arousal. The brain region in which caffeine gets most of its physiological effects is the brainstem, a very evolutionarily old part of the nervous system, meaning that most animals that have spinal cords throughout history um, have had something like a brainstem. It is divided up into several distinct parts, but in general, the brainstem is going to be regulating very autonomic, involuntary bodily processes like reflexes, respiration, blood circulation, eating, and really basic movements. Caffeine blocks adenosine receptors at brainstem sites, resulting in an increased breathing rate and constriction of blood vessels. Finally, as we've talked a bit about so far, and as you can tell from the picture of the acetylcholine pathway, there's a lot of use of this neurotransmitter, acetylcholine, in the cortex and the hippocampus. Caffeine has been shown to increase the excitability of hippocampal neurons, and it's argued that that is part of the increased cognitive effects of caffeine, like test performance scores and arousal and attention, and that this has a lot to do with the, uh, the heightened activity of certain cortical areas. And this heightened activity is the result of an increase and in inactivation of what is called an ascending neurotransmitter system. Basically, brain regions below the cortex, appropriately called subcortical, produce various neurotransmitters. And through connections that literally go up in the direction up into the brain or ascend, uh, end up covering many of the cortical areas and areas close to the cortex, like the limbic areas, with these neurotransmitters, resulting in all sorts of interesting changes in activity. So to recap, 
caffeine acts on the central nervous system by blocking the adenosine receptor, a molecule located on neurons that when active reduces excitatory neurotransmitter release. So when blocked ends up increasing neurotransmitter release. Caffeine blocks adenosine receptors uh, in many subcortical brain regions that result in an increase in ascending neurotransmitter pathways, which ultimately ends up activating the cortex, the hippocampus, and several other brain regions, resulting in a stimulant effect that everybody who drinks coffee is trying to achieve. So, here's a nice uh, infographic to recap on all the information that we've covered in this video. Now, importantly, all of the information that I've covered here is not mine. I do not have the time or the money to run hundreds of experiments. Uh, all that I've done today is uh, show you the results of hard work from neuroscientists over the years. This is simply my presentation. So if you're interested in learning more, then please check out the links and references that I've got in the low bar. And as always, thank you for watching and have a wonderful day.